<clears throat> Hello, everyone. to see you here. See people posting stuff already. It's nice to see. <clears throat> I can't read it yet, but I'll read it when I get up there. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Vast is the robe of liberation. A formless field of benefaction. I wear the Tathagata's teaching, bring all creations. Vast is the robe of liberation. A formless field of benefaction. I wear the Tathagata's teaching, bring all creations. Vast is the robe of liberation. A formless field of benefaction. I wear the Tathagata's teaching, freeing all creations. All evil karma ever committed by me, sensible, on account of my beginningless greed, anger, and ignorance, born of my body, mouth, and thought. Now I atone for it all, all evil karma ever committed by me since of old, on account of my beginningless greed, anger, and ignorance, born of my body, mouth, and thought. Now I atone for it all. All evil karma ever committed by me since of old on account of my beginningless greed, anger, and ignorance born of my body, mouth, and thought. Now I atone for it all. fragrance of this incense invites the awakened mind to be present with us now. The fragrance of this incense fills our room, protects and guards our minds from wrong thinking. The fragrance of this incense unites us. With precepts, concentration, and insight, we offer it for all beings. <clears throat> Homage to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. I go to the Buddha for guidance. I shall become one with the Buddha. I resolve that I shall each day follow the way of life he laid down for us to walk and awaken to his supreme wisdom. I go to the Dharma for guidance. I shall become one with the Dharma. The gates of Dharma are manifold. I vow to enter them all. The goal of wisdom is ever beyond. 
I shall attain it. I go to the sangha for guidance. I shall become one with the sangha in the spirit of universal fellowship. And as a member of the sangha, I pledge myself to strive for the enlightenment of all beings. The Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upward to the skies and downward to the depths, outward and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, sitting or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into the world of suffering. May I be happy and well. May no harm come to me. May I learn compassion. May all my friends, family, and those I love be happy and well. May no harm come to them. May they learn compassion. May all those troubled in body, mind, and spirit be happy and well. May no harm come to them. May they learn compassion. May all those who have hurt me in body, mind, and spirit be happy and well. May no harm come to them. May they learn compassion. May all those I have hurt in body, mind, and spirit be happy and well. May no harm come to them. May they learn compassion. May all my enemies be happy and well. May no harm come to them. May they learn compassion. May all living beings be happy and well. May no harm come to them. May they learn compassion. A little sniffly tonight. Sorry about that. It's just a little bit. Not a cold or anything. Let's <clears throat> take about three nice deep breaths. Focus especially on letting your abdominals be soft so your lungs can fill and empty completely. Let your breath settle into a comfortable rhythm. And reflect on your purpose for being here, to awaken your Buddha nature.
Buddha awakening is free from greed. Freed from hatred, freed from delusion, Sakyamuni Buddha awakened to this state, and because of his awakening, we have a path of practice that will help us wake up that way also. So just reflect on this for a moment. generate goodwill for all beings between ourselves. May I be happy. May I be free from animosity. May I be free from stress and affliction. May I look after myself with ease. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free from animosity. May all beings be free from stress and affliction. May all beings look after themselves with ease.
take a moment to scan the body. Just being present with the breath and the body. And if you'd like, you can run your attention from the top of your head down to the soles of your feet. Releasing any tightness. Accepting any unpleasant sensations. Everything that arises will change. Nothing that arises is self. phenomena are ultimately stressful. Awakening to the Buddha nature is possible. So existence is ultimately good. So to end this meditation, I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes of just silence. If you pray, you can acknowledge that today things changed and changed probably for the better. And if you like to pray, you can pray for that. Or just appreciate that you live in a civilized country where change is possible, where progress moves generally in the direction of better. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes of silence for you to observe that however you'd like to.
Buddha nature pervades the whole universe existing right here now and offering flock, candles and incense, hearing the Dharma and training the mind, great merit is attained. We dedicate this merit to the great master Shakyamuni Buddha, the all pervading and everlasting three treasures, the 16 guardians and all protectors of the Dharma and their relations throughout space and time, to all ancestors of the Sangha and all beings in the Dharma world. May penetrating light dispel the darkness of ignorance so that all karma will be resolved and my flow will bloom in eternal spring. May the Dharma body maintain strength and health and years of life be lengthened for all teachers of this Sangha. May their vows be fully realized and may they live in perfect peace with Buddha Dharma. We pray for those suffering from violence and those who grieve for them, for those living in oppression, for all who are imprisoned who should be free, for refugees from violence, hunger, and catastrophe, man-made or natural. We pray for the health and well-being of those suffering from diseases of body, mind, or spirit, and those working toward the healing of those afflictions. May they be serene through all their troubles and may we realize the enlightened way together. Sabe sata sada hantu. Ave ra sukha jivi no, kutang punya falang mai hong, sabe bhagi bhawantu te. May all beings always live happily, free from animosity. May all share in the blessings that spring from the good we have done. Goodness, y'all have been posting a lot since I first went live. Yeah, I suspect a lot of people are feeling confident, happy, relieved, all those things. Um, so, Jeff, I, the celebration doesn't start till 8.30, right? So I don't want to miss the Foo Fighters either. But I can always come back and look at it later. But I think I think it starts at eight thirty. I think that's what it said. Um, okay. So I've had a few people recently ask me about forgiveness, and um, uh, I can't remember who all it was, but it's one of those things that. Foo Fighters 8.30, yeah, that's what I thought. Um, one of those things that comes up periodically. And so I thought it would be good to talk about, and, you know, <laughs> it probably will will be forgiving some people in recent, in, in the near future. You know, at, at one time or another, everyone experiences some sort of physical or emotional harm either by the hand or the word of another person. And we tend to recover from physical wounds pretty quickly, but emotional wounds can stay sore for a long time. And healing a deep emotional wound has to start with something like forgiveness. Um, and, and that can be a difficult process that can take time. And, I, and just to qualify this, I don't like the term forgiveness. It, it has some implications that I don't really think are, are very accurate. A lot of times people think that to forgive means to forget, you know, forgive and forget. Um, and, and, you know, it's really a very personal thing and really a situational thing. It really depends on who you are and what your relationship is and that sort of thing. But um, I think, Probably all the major religions recognize the importance of forgiveness in one way or another. The Buddhism is not an exception. The Buddha saw forgiveness as an essential ingredient in a harmonious and peaceful society. Although it's not something that comes up often, and I'm not sure that there's a word um, in, you know, that the Buddha would have used in Pali or Sanskrit that, that translates exactly to what we call forgiveness, but Tanisaro Bhikkhu, who's the abbot of Metaphorist Monastery, and I know you've heard me refer to him before, he summed up the Buddhist view of this really well in an essay, that, and I wanted to share with you what he said. He said, uh, the Pali word for forgiveness, kama, K-H-A-M-A, -A, not 
not not comma like karma, but comma with a, an H in it, also means the earth. So a mind like the earth, which is non-reactive and unperturbed. So if you forgive me for harming you, you decide then uh, uh, you've decided not to retaliate, to seek no revenge. You don't have to like me. You simply unburden yourself of the weight of resentment and cut the cycle of retribution that would otherwise keep us ensnarled in an ugly samsaric wrestling match. This is a gift you can give us both, totally on your own without my having to know or understand what you've done. So that's a, a really kind of interesting way of looking at that. A uh, mind like the earth is non-reactive and unperturbed. You can do anything to the earth and it doesn't really well, that's not quite true. Maybe that's not as good as, <laughs> I don't know. We used to think we couldn't harm the earth, but you know, you, you can kick it if you want to. It's not going to go off its rails. It's not going to ret retaliate to you. Um, and so you unburden yourself of the weight of resentment and cut the cycle of retribution that would otherwise keep you and whoever you're angry at is snarled in an ugly samsaric wrestling match. That's a really interesting thing to talk, to talk about. That so samsara is the cycle of coming and going. And, you know, we've been going through the Dhammapada on Thursdays for some time now. And there are several uh, backstories to the Dhammapada that have to do with, you know, hatred anger and things like that perpetuating from one lifetime to a net to the next you know people coming back and still going after each other in totally different forms so anyway um, so if you're if you can be non-reactive like that you know that's that's a pretty big deal that's asking a lot but that can be a goal of your practice to be unperturbed you can use that as a reason to let go of the weight of resentment. So you just don't keep coming back in this life, even to this kind of struggle over your anger. But uh, I want to give you something kind of practical to work with. And there's a professor uh, named Robert Enright. He's at the University of Wisconsin. And he's actually done a lot of studies specifically on the subject of forgiveness and is considered to be one of the world's foremost authorities on forgiveness and how to do it. Which, and I came across some of his stuff and I was kind of surprised at how neatly it uh, aligned with a lot of Buddhist thought. Um, so he, first of all, he talked about the benefits of forgiving. You can choose to forgive rather than hold on to debilitating anger and resentment. In doing so, an amazing transformation begins. The black clouds of anxiety and depression give way to enhanced self-esteem and genuine feelings of hopefulness. Not real crazy about that, but it's okay. It's what, it's what he said, not what I said. When you forgive, you may benefit the person you forgive, but you benefit yourself far more. By liberating yourself from pain and sorrow, you can reclaim your life and find the peace that your anger had stolen. Um, so that's a pretty good description of why turning forgiveness into a habit is a good thing. But everyone brings their own capacities to this process and has their own issues to work through. So there's not a real straightforward, you know, ABC process that will fit everyone exactly. But um, if you're dealing with resentment and anger, want to develop forgiveness, you'd have to commit to putting some effort into it and not expect results overnight. There's nothing, there's no five easy steps to letting go of the past. So the first step though, so there are, there are steps. They're just not easy steps, right? The first step, and this is coming from Enright, and I, and I agree with him, is to recognize that it's worth the effort to forgive. And if you want to practice that, maybe start with somebody pretty easy and work your way up. You know how with working with Meta Bhavana and Tonglin and stuff, it, a lot of the time when you're wishing people happiness, it, when you get to the adversary, you know, you don't want to start with the person that you're 
you know, who's harmed you the worst. You want to start with somebody who just bugs you, right? And then kind of work your way up. You get used to the to the idea of being, uh, of having goodwill for people that you don't really like very much. Um, and, it, and it gets easier to kind of go up the ladder anyway. So when we're starting a process like this, we want to see the situation clearly. As you probably know, the first factor in the Eightfold Path, the Noble Eightfold Path, is right view. And that means seeing clearly the cause of suffering. So to start, accept that you have this animosity towards someone because of something that they did. And then ask yourself, how much pain do you feel because of what they did? And this is important. How much pain because of what they did? Don't focus on how bad they are as people. Just look at how much suffering you're experiencing. And if it's really not very much, that might be all you have to do. I've had situations where I realized that pretty much the only suffering involved was me ruminating about what had happened. That there was the situation itself had caused very little trouble. And so once you realize, oh, the, the big problem here is me thinking about it, it becomes a lot easier to let it go. And then the next step is to decide that there's enough stress that you want to work on this and ask yourself, how did this incident negatively impact my life? In other words, consider what physical and psychological harm was done. How might your views of other people been affected by what that happened? How might your trust have been impacted? Your ability to trust others might have been impacted by this. Acknowledge that the incident wasn't okay and accept any negative feelings that arise as you're thinking about this. So determine to accept and coexist with the unpleasant feelings associated with the harm done to you. So a lot of the time, you know, we want to feel a certain way, especially when we're doing a certain kind of work. It's important to recognize that feelings are symptoms. They're not the problem itself. And so we can coexist with unpleasant feelings that are associated with this stuff and avoid compounding the pain by denying it or refusing to experience it. So, you know, a lot of times when people start to meditate, they hear about the benefits of compassion. They hear that greed, anger is a poison. You want to let go of it and stuff like that then they start trying to repress negative feelings. And that's really not helpful either. So if you can accept the feelings and accept yourself with the feelings, then that gives you an opportunity to work on them. So uh, it makes it much easier. So the third step is to set our intentions toward changing the way we create suffering. So, you know, the second factor of the Eightfold Path is right resolve. And right resolve means now that you understand what the cause of suffering is, that you'll do things to let go of what causes suffering and to transcend it and do things that help. So you have to make a decision to forgive. And this includes understanding what it means to forgive, what you will do as a as the act of forgiveness. So basically, you're giving your adversary a gift. Even if they're nowhere around, even if they've passed away, we're still giving them freedom from our hatred. We're giving them mercy. We're deliberately letting go of resentments and ill will toward them, and instead offering them kindness, respect, and in, perhaps in some cases, love, and even friendship. Here's what's not involved. We aren't excusing someone's actions. Unless, you know, during the process of this, you realize that you were actually the bad person, right? That happens. Um, we're not forgetting what has been done. We're not ignoring any need for justice or accountability. Forgiveness doesn't have to include reconciliation. <coughs> reconciliation requires trust. And to forgive someone doesn't necessarily mean that they have somehow become trustworthy. I've talked in the past about my father, I'm sure. Usually when I talk about coming to terms with difficult people and difficult situations, 
he comes out. Um, because he was a violent person, he abused alcohol and he abused other people um, all through his adult life. <coughs> um, and it took some serious effort, but I forgave him for the abuse that I experienced from him. But I didn't forget it. I could be friendly toward him, but our relationship always stayed at arm's length because it wasn't safe to be around him. I had good reason not to trust him. Um, but I could stop hating him, even though I didn't start trusting him, right? I could stop being angry at him, even though I didn't, you know, we didn't hang out. He didn't turn into Henry Fonda. So once you make the decision to forgive, begin the process of doing that. And that requires compassion, which will require understanding. So you can ask yourself, questions like, what was life like for this person growing up? What wounds did they suffer that could have made them more likely to hurt you? What kinds of pressures or stresses were in their life at the time that he or she harmed you? So the answers to these questions are not excuses and they're not absolution. They don't absolve anyone of any responsibility, but it can help us see them as human. And it, it could help us prevent destructive acts in the future if we, you know, if we know what kind of things go into making people unstable. So my father, for example, was raised by parents who were emotionally disengaged. His own father's idea of um, parenting was based on whipping his kids with a razor strop. And if you don't know what a razor strop is, back when they used to shave people, shave with a straight razor, there was a long, rough leather strap that you used to strop to sharpen the, the razor. So he that's what they all got whipped with. Um, my father was bullied and basically abused, mistreated, neglected, and ignored by his older brothers. He had an older sister that he idealized. She was kind and caring toward him. And then she died when he was still a child and left him feeling abandoned. So, you know, it would be tough. And his father died when he was 15 too, by the way, which I don't know, that might've been a relief, but certainly it created a lot of problems for the household because, you know, this was before the days of, you know, life insurance policies and stuff. I mean, I don't know how his mother survived, but anyway. It would be difficult to make it through a life like that without suffering some pretty deep wounds. And so that's part of the karmic baggage that he brought with him, with him into parenthood. That doesn't excuse his abuse, but understanding his history, you know, makes it um, easier to not hate him and to let go of resentments and things like that. At least you can kind of understand it. And it's not about you anymore. When you can, when you can look at someone and see, look, this comes from a place of deep suffering. So the fifth step is, um, <clears throat> as long as you work on developing understanding and clarity, acknowledge any arising of compassion for the person who harmed you. So at the root of their actions relate confusion, mistaken attitudes, misunderstanding, we all suffer from those, clinging, aversion, misunderstanding. Those are universal phenomena. And so as you work toward developing understanding, just see, does your heart soften toward them? So, so step six is to think of some kind of gift that you can offer to the person that you're trying to forgive. So as I said earlier, to forgive is in itself a gift. It's a gift of mercy, maybe to someone who has been unmerciful toward you. When we give, it makes us feel better and it makes us more likely to give again. So if you can extend some kindness to the person, even just a smile or a kind word, that makes your forgiveness more tangible. It's one thing to sit there and think, oh, I forgive this person. It's another thing to forgive them and actually express it in some kind way. Now, that doesn't mean you put yourself in harm's way. If it's not safe to interact with the person, maybe just pray for them or send them wishes for happiness in your meditations 
or if they've passed away, keep them in mind when the next time you do feeding the hungry ghosts service or something, you know, you can acknowledge them uh, on, on Ulambana, <clears throat> that sort of thing. Finally, look for the seventh step. Look for a way to find meaning and purpose from this practice. So you might, for example, use this as a way to become more empathetic toward other people or be more mindful about how your own actions affect others. Uh, if we have experienced a deep emotional wound, if we can accept what has happened, accept how we feel, make a deliberate effort to forgive, then we can turn our attention away from how we feel to what needs to be done. So you might work toward helping others who have experienced similar victimization, for instance, you might help other people to avoid harming other people, someone else. So I did something like this uh, that helped me in part to get over my relationship with my father. And um, it was actually after he had passed away, but I spent several years working in a domestic abuse resource organization in the Orlando area. And we went into schools and we talked about dating violence. And the idea was to help teenagers recognize the signs that a relationship was becoming abusive, uh, understanding the risks of being in a relationship like that, learn how to get help. And in the process, we actually also talked to some young people who were witnesses, had witnessed to parents in those kinds of relationships. And so it gave us an opportunity to direct them toward resources and to help them. And we had a couple of guys come to us who recognized that they might have abusive tendencies themselves and they sought help for themselves. So, you know, something like that. I mean, and honestly, I, I didn't go looking for that. It kind of found me as sort of, you know, accidentally I was working in theater and, you know, one thing led to another. I ended up meeting these people and, and being able to do this project. But it was really rewarding. And it was especially rewarding because it gave me a chance to work with exactly the kinds of situations that I had been in. So, um, and, and having to experience those things firsthand, you know, it makes you uh, probably better at dealing with them with other people if you can. So I know I've mentioned before, uh, a famous exchange between a struggling Zen student and Soen Roshi, the, the famous Zen master. And the student came to him. The student was having a lot of trouble with his meditation. He came and said, Master, I'm so discouraged. What can I do? And Soen Roshi answered him, encourage others. So we can encourage others who are struggling with forgiveness then it can give greater meaning to our own efforts to forgive. And I think it can help us become more forgiving people ourselves. So I hope that that was helpful to those of you who are struggling with forgiveness uh, issues. Um, <clears throat> I haven't read, there's a, uh, I, ha I haven't read the book on forgiveness. I think there's at least one book that Insight, in right, sorry, in right is written um, on the subject of forgiveness. Um, <clears throat> and um, so if, if you thought this was helpful, you might want to dig a little deeper into that. Um, so I know everybody wants to go and watch the uh, uh, post-inaugural festivities, and I do too, so I understand. Um, but before we go, <clears throat> there's uh, something coming up that I want to make you aware of that um, I think some of you will, uh, will appreciate. So I've, I've mentioned a couple of times that I've been working on this thing with Zen Peacemakers and Volusia Remembers. So Zen Peacemakers International is a, a, a pretty sizable organization that was founded by Bernie Glassman, who was, uh, uh, Bernie Glassman Roshi, who was a, <clears throat> a well-known, uh, Zen master, uh, and uh, <coughs> excuse me, he uh, he passed away not all that long ago. Um, the organization is worldwide. They they have for a long time been doing 
things remotely. Not everything, but they've been having remote sagas and stuff like that since way before we needed it, where everybody needed it because of COVID. Um, and one of the things that they do, um, that they mainly do face to face, are are called bearing witness retreats. And these are where you kind of immerse yourself in awareness of something that has happened. Um, and, you know, in order to become more intimately acquainted with it, see your own role in it, and, and find a way to, to take some loving action around it. And so they started this with um, bearing witness retreats to Auschwitz, and then to, uh, uh, they've done, done them in uh, Black Hills of North Dakota, um, and they do bearing witness retreats around homelessness in New York. So um, I, when COVID happened, I wanted to get more involved with Zen peacemakers because they're, they're in my, my lineage on the Zen side of things. And so uh, I, I, I kind of was aware of these things and, and I started, I attended a few of their online sets and um, as I was doing that, I was also kind of looking through stuff that we had considered do, that we were talking about doing something with and at Stetson in the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life, one of which was uh, uh, there's a project called Volusia Remembers, which is a uh, uh, they're, they're working to create monuments at uh, lynching sites and to make people aware basically of the history of racial terror in this particular part of the United States. And so um, they were kind of working toward doing a soil collection ceremony somewhere and wanting to create uh, uh, markers to go at these places and stuff. And um, so I kind of thought Bearing witness retreats, Felicia remembers there seems to be a similarity. There seems to be a, 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 a unity of purpose. And so I, I ha talked to uh, the executive director of Zen Peacemakers. I didn't realize he was the executive director at the time. He was the guy who was leading one of the, uh, what, one of the virtual services or something. I can't remember exactly where, what it was. And I told him that I'd had this thought and I wanted to know about bearing witness retreats and maybe we could do something along those lines here in Volusia County. And one thing led to another We, after a bunch of meetings and conversations with Zen Peacemakers and Volusia Remembers, and then the two of them together and all of that, we, um, it, it happens that they were planning a virt virtual retreats. They did the, their Auschwitz retreat this year virtually, and they were looking to do something around the topic of race. And so what Volusia Remembers was doing, of course, integrates very well into that. And so, uh, so to get cut to the chase on the last weekend of February, the 26th, 27th, and 28th, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, from noon to three each of those days, uh, Zen Peacemakers International will be presenting uh, a, a Race in America, an Intimate Plunge. So you can go to Zen Peacemakers International uh, website, Google it like that, you'll find it, and you'll find the information about it. Um, Volusia Remembers will be a pretty significant chunk of day two, the Saturday. Also, a Stetson professor, one that I, I know quite well and that has worked with uh, our office a lot, the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life, is going to give the framing conversation. Um, the event's going to be framed around uh, the, the book Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. Um, and so Rajni Shanker Brown is going to give the opening remarks and, and, and so on. Um, that's going to be on Friday. So I encourage you, um, if you have the time, 
or can make the time to attend this retreat. I did the Auschwitz one, the, which was their first virtual uh, bearing witness retreat. It was a very profound experience. Um, and uh, uh, I'm really looking forward to this one. Uh, I, I'm not gonna be a big part of presenting it or anything like that. I, I kind of got everybody in the same room and then figured I'd done my job. That's not quite true, but uh, I'll be there for the presentation and I'll say a few words at some point, I'm sure. So anyway, if you want any more information about that, go to Zen Peacemakers International. Of course, you can email me and I'll, I'll help you with any questions that you have. So uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your practice. Uh, I look forward to um, moving through 2021 toward a better future for us all, put it that way. You know, it's still going to be a tough year, and I think we have some difficult things that we'll be facing. But, uh, you know, keep going, and uh, uh, we'll go it, we'll do it together. All right. So thank you very much. Have a great evening. And I will see you tomorrow night if you come to the Zoom meetings. I'll be giving a Dharma talk at 11 o'clock on YouTube on Sunday. I'll be back at White Sands on the first Sunday in February. So have a good night.